Value and Need as Organizing Factors in Perception This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard Value and Need as Organizing Factors in Perception by Jerome S. Broner and Cecile C. Goodman of Harvard University Throughout the history of modern psychology until very recent times, perception has been treated as though the perceiver were a passive recording instrument of rather complex design. One might, in most experiments, describe him in much the same graphical terms as one uses to describe the latest piece of recording apparatus obtainable from Stolting or the American Optical Company. Such psychology, practiced as it were in vitro, has fallen short of clarifying the nature of perception in everyday life, much as did the old nerve muscle. Psychophysiology fall short of explaining behavior in everyday life. Both have been monumentally useful in their place. The names of Weber, Fechner, Wundt, Titchener, Hecht, and Crozier are safely ensconced in any respectable psychological hall of fame, but their work, like the work of the nerve muscle men, is only a beginning. For, as Professor Thurston has put it, quote, in these days when we insist so frequently on the interdependence of all aspects of personality, it would be difficult to maintain that any of these functions, such as perception, is isolated from the rest of the dynamical system that constitutes the person. The problem is, indeed, to understand how the process of perception is affected by other concurrent mental functions, and how these functions, in their turn, are affected by the operation of perceptual processes. Given a dark room and a highly motivated subject, one has no difficulty in demonstrating Cork's laws of phenomenal movement. Lead the subject from the dark room to the marketplace, and then find out what it is he sees moving and under what conditions, and Cork's laws, though still valid, describe the situation about as well as the laws of color mixture describe one's feelings before an El Greco canvas. The discrepancy between the dark room and the marketplace we have in the past found it convenient to dismiss by invoking various de ex machina, attention, apperception, un bewuster schluss, einstellung, preparatory set, etc., like the vengeful and unannounced stepbrother from Australia in the poorer murder mysteries, they turn up at the crucial juncture to do the dirty work. Though such constructs are useful, perception itself must remain the primary focus. To shift attention away from it by invoking poorly understood intervening variables does little service. What we must study before invoking such variables are the variations perception itself undergoes when one is hungry, in love, in pain, or solving a problem. These variations are as much a part of the psychology of perception as court's laws. It is the contention of this paper that such perceptual phenomena are as scientifically measurable in terms of appropriate metrics as such more hallowed phenomena as flicker fusion, constancy, or tonal attributes. But let us pause first to construct a sketchy terminology. Let us, in what ensues, distinguish heuristically between two types of perceptual determinants. These we shall call autochthonous and behavioral. Under the former we group those properties of the nervous system, highly predictable, which account for phenomena like simple pair formation, closure, and contrast, or, at another level, tonal masking, difference, and summation tones, flicker fusion, paradoxical cold, and binaural beats. Given ideal darkroom conditions and no compelling distractions, the average organism 
responds to set physical stimuli in these relatively fixed ways. Octothenous determinants, in brief, reflect directly the characteristic electrochemical properties of sensory end organs and nervous tissue. Under the category of behavioral determinants, we group those active, adaptive functions of the organism which lead to the governance and control of all higher level functions, including perception, the laws of learning and motivation, such personality dynamics as repression, the operation of quasi-temperamental characteristics like introversion and extroversion, social needs and attitudes, and so on. Underlying these behavioral determinants, doubtless, are a host of physiological mechanisms. But we can hardly wait until we understand these before tackling experimentally the role of behavioral determinants in perception. The physiology of Weber's law is still more or less obscure, yet the enunciation of it has been recognizably useful, even to the physiologist for whom it has been a challenge to discovery. A paper of this kind cannot contain any extensive review of the literature on those perceptual dynamics which we have called behavioral, yet it is necessary to pass rapidly over some of the notable facts and experiments which have forced us to draw certain distinctions and make bold claims about the mensurability of behavioral determinants. First, we have the facts of sensory conditioning a term first used by Caisson. Starting with the work of Perkey in 1910, it has been demonstrated repeatedly by Warner Brown, Elson, Coffin, and others that subjects can be conditioned to see and hear things in much the same way as they can be conditioned to perform such overt acts as knee-jerking, eye-blinking, or salivating. Pair a sound and a faint image frequently enough fail to present the image, and the subject sees it anyway when the sound is presented. Any student of suggestion, whether or not he has perused Bird's exhaustive bibliography of the literature on the subject, knows that. Not perception? Why not? The subject sees what he reports as vividly as he sees the phi phenomenon. Closely related are such experiments as those of Haggard and Rose, Proshansky and Murphy and Schaefer and Murphy, demonstrating the role of reward and punishment in altering perceptual organization. Haggard and Rose show that the extent of autokinetic movement can be altered by a system of rewards. Proshansky and Murphy, that discriminable differences in the perception of lines and weights can be similarly altered. Schaefer and Murphy that, given an ambiguous figure ground configuration, what is seen as figure and what as ground can be altered by a system of reward and punishment. Another group of researches has demonstrated that what is seen in a complex configuration is not determined solely by the laws of gestalt, but by practice. Among experimenters who have confirmed this generalization are Henley, Ferrer, Brawley, Leeper, and Zhang. Closely related are the experiments of Tholus, showing that phenomenal constancy, or as he calls it, regression to the real object, reflects the habits of the individual. Art students, for example, see the real object, its color, shape, and brightness less readily, show greater phenomenal constancy than matched individuals with no art training. Indeed, the Viant has shown that the appearance of a surface as light gray in shadow or dark gray in light can be controlled by simple Pavlovian conditioning, the CS being a sound or a button in the visual field. And all of us are fond of citing the work of Hatton in the Torres Straits, demonstrating that these primitive island spearfishers are, 
most likely as a result of their experience with spears, considerably less susceptible to the Muller liar illusion. Sheriff's classic experiments on social factors are too well known to need any elucidation here. Demonstrating further the role of social factors in perception are the experiments of Zuc Cardos and Fazil, students of Egon Brunswick, who showed that the subjective number equation for matching a standard cluster of stamps or coins to a variable depended in part upon the value of the coins or stamps in the standard and variable clusters. With many refinements and extensions, these experiments have been repeated in America by Ansbacher. One can go on to cite many more experiments, but in a very brief summary review, that would be impossible. Let us conclude, then, with two pieces of research, one French, the other Swiss, indicating the possible connection of general personality traits and perception. Binet and Mele and Tobler have suggested that the child is more susceptible to illusions, more a prey to those organizing factors which, as adults, we call distorting. Binet has shown that as the child grows older, his susceptibility to the muller liar illusion decreases. The contribution of Melly and Tobler has been to show that, as the child ages, his thresholds for seeing stroboscopic movement becomes higher. Whether from these two experiments, plus such incidental observations as Piaget's, to the effect that the child sees the moon as following him, we can draw any conclusions about increasing perceptual realism as a function of age is open to question. Yet the way has been open to those who wish to investigate this area further. So much for prior research. There exists a fruitful, if slim, body of literature on behavioral factors in perception. Where does one go from here? Two approaches are open. Armed with our slender reed of empirical proof, we can set about the task of systemization, indulging in SR's topology or psychoanalytic constructs to suit the taste. There is already one brilliant theoretical structure to account for many of the facts we have been discussing, presented in Egon Brunswick's Warnung und Gegenstandsvolt, or we may go on to the empirical demonstration of general hypotheses concerning the relation of behavior, dynamics, and perception. Both are indispensable activities. The present paper, however, is concerned mainly with empirical hypotheses, but certain minimum systematic assumptions must first be made clear to bring these hypotheses into clear focus. The organism exists in a world of more or less ambiguously organized sensory stimulation. What the organism sees, what is actually there, perceptually represents some sort of compromise between what is presented by autochthonosis processes and what is selected by behavioral ones. Such selection, we know, is determined not only by learning, as already indicated, but also by motivational factors such as have been indicated for hunger by Sanford and Levine, Shen, and Murphy. The selective process in perception we shall refer to as a perceptual hypothesis, using the term with crutch to denote a systematic response tendency. Such an hypothesis may be set into operation by a need, by the requirements of learning a task, or by any internally or externally imposed demands on the organism. If a given perceptual hypothesis is rewarded by leading to food, water, love, fame, or what not, it will become fixated. And the experimental literature, notably the work of Ellison and Leeper, indicates that the fixation of sensory conditioning is very resistant to extinction. As fixation takes place, the perceptual hypothesis 
grows stronger not only in the sense of growing more frequent in the presence of certain types of stimulation but also more perceptually accentuated perceptual objects which are habitually selected become more vivid have greater clarity or greater brightness or greater apparent size Two other systematic matters must concern us before we turn to the experiments. One has to do with perceptual compromise, the other with perceptual equivocality. Frequently, alternative hypotheses operate. A quick glimpse of a man in gray on a European battlefield may leave us in doubt as to whether he is a civilian or a Wehrmacht infantryman. Almost inevitably, one or the other hypothesis prevails, and the field is perceived as either one or the other. But in spite of the dominance of a single hypothesis in perception, compromise also occurs. Using Ansbacher's experiments as an example, a group of small paper squares is seen both in terms of number and in terms of value as stamps. What results, if you will, is a perception of number value we know precious little about such perceptual compromises, although we shall be discussing experiments demonstrating their operation. As for equivocality, or ambiguity in the perceptual field, it has generally been supposed that the greater the equivocality, the greater the chance for behavioral factors in perception to operate, all other things being equal. Sheriff, chose the autokinetic phenomenon to work with for this reason. Porshansky and Murphy worked close to threshold illumination with similar intent. Within broad limits, which we shall discuss, the generalization is valid, insofar as equivocality reduces the organizing capacity of autodonous perceptual determinants. How important this generalization is, we, who think so exclusively in terms of the well-controlled darkroom experiment, often forget. For in everyday life, perception is, by and large, a series of quick looks, glances, inattentive listenings, furtive touches. Save for what is at the very focus of interested attention, the world of sense is more equivocal than our textbook writers seem to think. Empirical Hypotheses we may now turn to the experiments with which this paper is primarily concerned. Three general hypotheses, growing out of the systematic principles just presented, are under consideration. 1. The greater the social value of an object, the more will it be susceptible to organization by behavioral determinants. It will be selected perceptually from among alternate perceptual objects will become fixated as a perceptual response tendency and will become perceptually accentuated. 2. The greater the individual need for a socially valued object, the more marked will be the operation of the behavioral determinants. 3. Perceptual equivocality will facilitate the operation of behavioral determinants only insofar as equivocality reduces the operation of autochthonous determinants without reducing the effectiveness of behavioral determinants. In the experiments reported here, only one aspect of behavioral determination will be treated, what we have called accentuation, the tendency for sought-after perceptual objects to become more vivid. Perceptual selectivity and fixation have already been demonstrated in other experiments, though they remain poorly systematized. For purposes of economy of exposition, we omit consideration of them here, though they constitute important variables in the broader research project of which the present experiments are a part. The Subjects and the Apparatus the subjects were thirty ten-year-old children of normal intelligence, divisible according to certain characteristics to be discussed shortly into three groups. 
two experimental and one control. The apparatus consisted of a rectangular wooden box, nine by nine by eighteen inches, at one end of which was a five-inch square ground glass screen, and a knob at its lower right-hand corner. At the center of the ground glass screen was an almost circular patch of light, 16.2 approximate foot candles, cast upon the back of the screen by a 60-watt incandescent light shining through an iris diaphragm which could be varied in diameter from one eighth inches to two inches by turning the knob on the front end of the box all that was visible to the subject was the box with its ground glass screen and the circle of light whose diameter he could change by turning the knob the circle was not truly round containing the familiar nine ellipsoid sides found in the Balshan Loam iris diaphragm. It was so close to round, however, that subjects had no difficulty making the subjective equations required of them. Subjects individually sat in a chair in front of the screen on the box with the light circle slightly below eye level. The box rested on a table behind which sat the experimenter. The child was told that this was a game and that he was to make the circle of light on the box the same size as various objects he was shown or told about. Before beginning judgments, each child, with no urging, was encouraged to see how large and small the circle of light could be made. The two experimental groups received the same treatment. Two series were run for these groups, comprising twenty of the children in all. First, the child was asked to estimate the sizes of coins from a penny through a half dollar from memory. He did the first in ascending order of value, then in descending order, always making two judgments for each coin named, one from the open, the other from the closed position of the iris diaphragm. Four judgments were made for each coin by each child. No inkling was given the child as to how close he had come. Following the memory series and using the same order of presentation, a similar series was then run with coins present. Coins, individually, were held close to the center of the palm of the left hand at a level with the light circle and six inches to its left. The subjects took as much time as suited them. A control group of ten subjects followed a procedure identical with the one just described. Instead of coins, medium gray cardboard discs of identical size were employed. No mention of money was made to this group. Results Let us compare the difference between judgments of size of coins and identically sized cardboard discs. Two things can be noted in Figure 1, which presents judgments of experimentals and controls with coins present. First off, coins socially valued objects, are judged larger in size than gray discs. Secondly, the greater the value of the coin, the greater is the deviation of apparent size from actual size. The exception to this generalization is the half dollar, overestimation of which falls off below that of a quarter. By way of the sheerest guess, one might explain this reversal of the curve in terms of the lesser reality value of a half dollar as compared with a quarter for the ten-year-old. A half dollar, at that age, is, so to speak, almost too valuable to be real. More likely, there is some simple autochthonous reason for the reversal, yet no such reversal is found in curves plotted for adults. The difference between experimentals and controls is, of course, highly significant. The variance in overestimation in the experimental groups introduced by using coins of different value is similarly significant. Our results, as handled by the Postman-Brunner adaptation of the analysis of variance to psychophysical data, show that variances due to coin value and due to using disks versus coins 
yield F-scores convertible to p-values of less than 0 0.01. So much for the first hypothesis, that socially valued objects are susceptible to behavioral determinants in proportion to their value. Consider now the second hypothesis, that the greater the subjective need for a socially valued object, the greater will be the role of behavioral determinants of perception. In the second experimental variation, the experimental group was divided into two component groups. One we will call the rich group, the other the poor group, each comprising ten subjects. Well-to-do subjects were drawn from a progressive school in the Boston area, catering to the sons and daughters of prosperous business and professional people. The poor subjects came from a settlement house in one of Boston's slum areas. The reasonable assumption is made that poor children have a greater subjective need for money than rich ones. When the figures presented in Figure 1 are broken down into scores for rich and poor groups, a striking difference will be noted. The poor group overestimates the size of coins considerably more than does the rich. Again, there are some irregularities in the curves. The drop-off for the half-dollar we have already sought to explain. As for the dip in the rich group's curve at a dime, the explanation is problematical. All curves which we have plotted for adults, and by now we have collected more than 2,000 judgments, show this dip. Perhaps it is due to the discrepancy between the relative size and value of the dime, perhaps to some inherent characteristic of the coin itself. The difference between rich and poor is highly significant. Analysis of variance showing that the source of variance is significant beyond the p-level of 0 0.01. Our second hypothesis cannot, then, be rejected. It is notable, too, that the interaction between the parameters of economic status and value of coins yields an F-score convertible to a p-value between 0 0.05 and 0 0.01, which leads to a secondary hypothesis. Given perceptual objects of the same class but varying in value, the effect of need for that class of objects will be to accentuate the most valuable objects most, the least valuable least, etc. What of ambiguity or perceptual equivocality? We have arbitrarily assumed that a situation in which one is judging size from memory is more equivocal than one in which the object being judged is in clear view six inches away from the test patch. The assumption is open to serious question, but let us examine what follows from it experimentally. Compare first the judgments of the rich group under conditions like those described with coin present as compared with coin as a mere memory image. The curves are in figure 3. It would seem that, for all values below a quarter, equivocality has the effect of making judgments conform more to actual size, aiding, in other words, the operation of autochthonous determinants. For values over a quarter, equivocality favors behavioral factors, making apparent size diverge still more from actual size. For the rich group, with coin present, a half dollar is overjudged by 17.4%, with coin absent by 34.7%. This finding is difficult to interpret by itself. Consider now figure 4, showing the discrepancy in absent and present judgments for the poor group. Here there is no crossing. Equivocality seems, in this group, to have the exclusive effect of bringing judgments down toward actual size. Equivocality even brings out the dime dip in the poor group. How account for the difference? Why does equivocality liberate behavioral determinants among the rich children for higher values and depress these factors for poor children? We can offer nothing but a guess one which needs confirmation by further research. Some years ago, Acer reported that in his study of children in Dundee, he found the fantasy life of the children 
of the unemployed strikingly choked off asked what they would like to be when grown normal children of employed parents gave such glamorous replies as cowboy or film star while children of the unemployed named the rather lowly occupations traditionally followed by members of their class in the figures just presented it is our contention that we are witnessing the same phenomenon in the case of the poor children judging coin size from memory a weakened fantasy is substituted for the compelling presence of a valued coin while among rich children equivocality has the effect of liberating strong and active fantasy are any other explanations available to account for the shape of the curves we have been concerned with here weber's law would predict in all cases a straight line plot parallel to the axis representing actual size dl should be a constant fraction of the stimulus whatever its magnitude if one were to treat the slope of the curves by reference to hollingworth's central tendency effect one should find a negative rather than a positive slope all values smaller than the center of the series should appear larger in size all larger than the center of the series smaller assuming that the hollingworth effect is mediated by autochthonous factors then it represents one more autochthonous factor outweighed by the behavioral determinants discussed in the course of this paper. In conclusion, only one point need be reiterated. For too long now, perception has been virtually the exclusive domain of the experimental psychologist with a capital E. If we are to reach an understanding of the way in which perception works in everyday life, we social psychologists and students of personality will have to join with the experimental psychologists and re-explore much of the ancient field of perception whose laws for too long have been taken for granted footnotes one the writers are greatly indebted to pauline b hahn and dr leo j postman for invaluable assistance and advice two P-values at the point zero one level were also found for constant errors introduced by ascending and descending value orders and for judgments made for the open and closed positions of the diaphragm. Since these parameters were controlled and balanced in the judgment data for the groups discussed, nothing further need to be said of them here. They will be discussed in another place. Analysis of variance was carried out both with percentage scores representing deviation of individual judgments from actual size and with raw scores. Necessary corrections suggested by Snedekor were used in the former method. The values presented here are applicable to both raw and percentage scores. 3. If the reader is a smoker, let him ask himself whether a dime will cover the hump on the camel which appears as a trademark on camel cigarettes. Hold the two six inches apart. In spite of the apparently small size of the coin, it will cover the camel's hump with margin to spare. 4. The difference between rich and poor children in their size judgments of absent and present coins, as here discussed, is statistically significant. The interaction variance for these two parameters economic status and presence absence of coins is at the point zero one level of significance end of value and need as organizing factors in perception by jerome s bruner and cecile c goodman Some Observations on the Organization of Personality Part 1 by Carl R. Rogers This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Read by O. Tree. Some Observations on the Organization of Personality Part 1 
by Carl R. Rogers, 1947. Address of the Retiring President of the American Psychological Association, the September 1947 Annual Meeting. First published in American Psychologist, Volume 2, pages 358 to 368. In various fields of science, rapid strides have been made when direct observation of significant processes has become possible. In medicine, when circumstances have permitted the physician to peer directly to the stomach of his patient, understanding of digestive processes has increased and the influence of emotional tension upon aspects of that process has been more accurately observed and understood. In our work with non-directive therapy, we often feel that we are having a psychological opportunity comparable to this medical experience. An opportunity to observe directly a number of the effective processes of personality. Quite aside from any question regarding non-directive therapy as therapy, here is a precious vein of observational material of unusual value for the study of personality. Characteristics of the observational material there are several ways in which the raw clinical data to which we have had access is unique in its value for understanding personality. The fact that these verbal expressions of inner dynamics are preserved by electrical recording makes possible a detailed analysis of a sort not heretofore possible. Recording has given us a microscope by which we may examine at leisure and in minute detail almost every aspect of what was, in its occurrence, a fleeting moment impossible of accurate observation. Another scientifically fortunate characteristic of this material is the fact that the viral productions of the client are biased to a minimal degree by the therapist. Material from client-centered interviews probably comes closer to being a pure expression of attitudes than has yet been achieved through other means. One can read through a complete recorded case or listen to it without finding more than half a dozen instances in which the therapist's views on any point are evident. One would find it impossible to form an estimate as to the therapist's views about personality dynamics. One could not determine his diagnostic views, his standards of behavior, his social class. The one value or standard held by the therapist which should exhibit itself in his tone of voice, responses, and activity is a deep respect for the personality and attitudes of the client as a separate person. It is difficult to see how this would bias the content of the interview, except to permit deeper expression than the client would ordinarily allow himself. This almost complete lack of any distorting attitude is felt and sometimes expressed by the client. One woman says, it is almost impersonal. I like you. Of course, I don't know why I should like you or why I shouldn't like you. It's a peculiar thing. I have never had that relationship with anybody before, and I have often thought about it. A lot of times I walk out with a feeling of elation that you think highly of me, and of course, at the same time, I have the feeling that he must think I'm an awful jerk, or something like that. But it doesn't really those things are not so deep that I can form an opinion one way or the other about you. Here it would seem that, even though you would like to discover some type of evolutional attitude, she is unable to do so. Public studies and research as yet unpublished bear out this point, that counselor responses, which are in any way evolutional or distorting, as to content, are at a minimum, thus enhancing the worth of such interviews for personality study. The counsel attitude of warmth and understanding, while well described by Snyder and Rogers, also helps to maximize the freedom of expression by the individual. The client experiences sufficient interest in him as a person, and sufficient acceptance to enable him to talk openly, not only about surface attitudes, but increasingly about intimate attitudes and feelings hidden even from himself. Hence, in these recorded interviews, we have material of very considerable depth, so far as personal dynamics is concerned, along with a freedom from distortion. Finally, the very nature of the interviews and the techniques by which they are handled give us a rare opportunity to see, to some extent, through the eyes of another person, to perceive the world as it appears to him, 
to achieve at least partially the internal frame of reference of another person. We see his behavior through his eyes, and also the psychological meaning which it had for him. We see also changes in personality and behavior, and the meanings which those changes have for an individual. We are admitted freely into the backstage of the person's living, where we can observe from within some of the dramas of internal change, which are often far more compelling and moving than the drama which is presented on the stage viewed by the public. Only a novelist or a poet could do justice to the deep struggles which are permitted to observe from within the client's own world of reality. This rare opportunity to observe so directly and so clearly the inner dynamics of personality is a learning experience of the deepest sort for the clinician. Most of the clinical psychology and psychiatry involves judgments about the individual, judgments which must, of necessity, be based on some framework brought to the situation by the clinician. To try continually to see and think with the individual as in client-centered therapy is a mind-stretching experience in which learning goes on a pace because the clinician brings to the interview no predetermined ear stick by which to judge the material. I wish in this paper to try to bring you some of the clinical observations which we have made as we have repeatedly paired through these psychological windows into personality, and to raise with you some of the questions about the organization of personality which these observations have forced upon us. I shall not attempt to present these observations in logical order, but rather in the order in which they impress themselves upon our notice. What I shall offer is not a series of research findings, but only the first step in that process of gradual approximation which we call science, a description of some observed phenomena which appear to be significant, and some highly tentative explanations of these phenomena. The relation of the organized perceptual field to behavior. One simple observation which is repeated over and over again in each successful therapeutic case seems to have rather deep theoretical implications. It is that, as changes occur in the perception of self and in the perception of reality, changes occur in behavior. In therapy, these perceptual changes are more often concerned with the self than with the external world. Hence we find in therapy that as the perception of self alters, behavior alters. Perhaps an illustration will indicate the type of observation upon which this statement is based. A young woman, a graduate student whom we shall call Miss Veep, came in for nine interviews. If we compare the first interview with the last, striking changes are evident. Perhaps some features of this change may be conveyed by taking from the first and last interviews all the major statements regarding self and all the major statements regarding current behavior. In the first interview, for example, her perception of herself may be crudely indicated by taking all her own statements about herself, grouping these which seem similar, but otherwise doing a minimum of editing and retaining so far as possible her own words. We then come out with this as the conscious perception of self which was hers at the outset of counseling. I feel disorganized, muddled. I have lost all direction. My personal life has disintegrated. I sought to experience things which from the forefront of my consciousness, but nothing sinks in very deep. Things don't seem real to me. I feel nothing matters. I don't have any emotional response to situations. I'm worried about myself. I haven't been acting like myself. It doesn't seem like me. I'm a different person altogether from what I used to be in the past. I don't understand myself. I haven't known what is happening to me. I have withdrawn from everything and feel all right only when I'm all alone and no one can expect me to do things. I don't care about my personal appearance. I don't know anything anymore. I feel guilty about the things I have left undone. I don't think I could ever assume responsibility for anything. If we attempt to evaluate this picture of self from an external frame of reference, various diagnostic levels may come to mind. Trying to perceive it solely from the client's frame of reference, we observe that to the young woman herself, 
she appears disorganized and not herself she is perplexed and almost unacquainted with what is going on in herself she feels unable and unwilling to function in any responsible or social way this is at least a sampling of the way she experiences or perceives herself her behavior is entirely consistent with this picture of self if we abstract all her statements describing her behavior in the same fashion as we abstracted her statements about self the following pattern emerges a pattern which in this case was corroborated by outside observation i couldn't get up nerve to come in before i haven't availed myself of help everything i should do or want to do i don't do i haven't kept in touch with friends i avoid making the effort to go with them i stop writing letters soon i don't answer letters or telephone calls i avoid contacts that would be professionally helpful i didn't go home though i said i would i failed to hand in my work in a course though i had it all done i didn't even buy clothing that i needed i haven't even kept my nails manicured i didn't listen to material we were studying i waste hours reading the funny papers i can spend the whole afternoon doing absolutely nothing the picture of behavior is very much in keeping with the picture of self and is summed up in the statement that everything i should do or want to do i don't do the behavior goes on in ways that seem to the individual beyond understanding and beyond control if we contrast this picture of self and behavior with the picture as it exists in the ninth interview thirty-eight days later we find both the perception of self and the ways of behaving deeply altered our statements about self are as follows i am feeling much better i am taking more interest in myself i do have some individuality some interests i seem to be getting a newer understanding of myself i can look at myself a little better i realize i am just one person with so much ability but i am not worried about it i can accept the fact that i am not always right i feel more motivation have more of a desire to go ahead i still occasionally regard the past though i feel less unhappy about it i still have a long ways to go i don't know whether i can keep the picture of myself i am beginning to evolve i can go on learning in school or out i do feel more like a normal person now i feel more i can handle my life myself i think i am at the point where i can go along on my own outstanding in this perception of herself are three things that she knows herself that she can view with comfort her assets and liabilities and finally that she has drive and control of that drive in this ninth interview the behavioral picture is again consistent with the perception of self it may be abstracted in these terms i have been making plans about school and about a job i have been working hard on a term paper i have been going to the library to trace down a topic of special interest and finding it exciting i have cleaned out my closets washed my clothes i finally wrote my parents i'm going home for the holidays i'm getting out and mixing with people i'm reacting sensibly to a fellow who is interested in me seeing both his good and bad points i'll work toward my degree i will start looking for a job this week her behavior in contrast to the first interview is now organized forward moving effective realistic and planful it is in accord with the realistic and organized view she has achieved of herself it is this type of observation in case after case that leads us to say with some assurance that as perception of self and reality change behavior changes likewise in cases where my term failures there appears to be no appreciable change in perceptual organization or in behavior what type of explanation might account for these concomitant changes in the perceptual field and the behavioral pattern let us examine some of the logical possibilities in the first place it is possible 
that factors unrelated to therapy may have brought about the altered perception and behavior. There may have been physiological processes occurring which produced the change. There may have been alternations in the family relationships, or in the social forces, or in the educational picture, or in some other area of cultural influence, which might account for the rather drastic shift in the concept of self and in the behavior. There are difficulties in this type of explanation, not only where there are no known gross changes in the physical or cultural situation, as far as Miss V was concerned, but the explanation gradually becomes inadequate when one tries to apply it to the many cases in which such change occurs. To postulate that some external factor brings the change, and that only by chance does this period of change coincide with the period of therapy, becomes an untenable hypothesis. Let us then look at another explanation, namely that the therapist exerted during the nine hours of contact a peculiarly potent cultural influence which brought about the change. Here again we are faced with several problems. It seems that nine hours scattered over five and one half weeks is a very minute portion of time in which to bring about alterations of patterns which have been building for thirty years. We would have to postulate an influence so potent as to be classed as traumatic. This theory is particularly difficult to maintain when we find, on examining the recorded interviews, that not once in the nine hours did the therapist express any evaluation, positive or negative, of the client's initial or final perception of self, or her initial or final mode of behavior. There was not only no evaluation, but no standards expressed by which evaluation might be inferred. There was, on the part of the therapist, evidence of warm interest in the individual, and thoroughgoing acceptance of the self and of the behavior as they existed initially, in the intermediate stages and at the conclusion of therapy. It appears reasonable to say that the therapist established certain definite conditions of interpersonal relations, but since the very essence of this relationship is respect for the person as he is at that moment, the therapist can hardly be regarded as a cultural force making for change. We find ourselves forced to a third type of explanation, a type of explanation which is not new to psychology, but which has had only partial acceptance. Briefly, it may be put that the object phenomena of changes seem most adequately explained by the hypothesis that, given certain psychological conditions, the individual has the capacity to reorganize his field of perception, including the way he perceives himself, and that a concomitant or resultant of this perceptual reorganization is an appropriate alteration of behavior. This puts into formal and objective terminology a clinical hypothesis which experiences forces upon the therapist using a client-centered approach. One is compelled through clinical observation to develop a high degree of respect for the ego-integrative forces residing within each individual. One comes to recognize that under proper conditions the self is a basic factor in the formation of personality and in the determination of behavior. Clinical experience would strongly suggest that the self is, to some extent, an architect of self, and the above hypothesis simply puts this observation into psychological terms. In support of this hypothesis, it is noted, in some cases, that one of the concomitants of success in therapy is the realization on the part of the client that the self has the capacity for reorganization. Thus, a student says, You know, I spoke of the fact that a person's background retards one, like the fact that my family life wasn't good for me, and my mother certainly didn't give me any of the kind of bringing up that I should have had. Well, I have been thinking that over. It's true up to a point. But when you get so that you can see the situation, then it's really up to you. Following this statement of the relation of the self to experience many changes occurred in this young man's behavior. In this, as in other cases, it appears that when the person comes to see himself as the perceiving organizing agent, then reorganization of perception and consequent changes in pattern of reaction take place. On the other side of the picture, we have frequently observed 
that when the individual has been authoritatively told that he is governed by certain factors or conditions beyond his control, it makes therapy more difficult. And it is only when the individual discovers for himself that he can organize his perceptions that change is possible. In veterans who have been given their own psychiatric diagnosis, the effect is often that of making the individual feel that he is under an unalterable doom, that he is unable to control the organization of his life. When, however, the self sees itself as capable of reorganizing its own perceptual field, a marked change in basic confidence occurs. Miss Nim, a student, illustrates this phenomena when she says, after having made progress in therapy, I think I do feel better about the future too, because it's as if I won't be acting in darkness. It's sort of, well, knowing somewhat why I act the way I do. And at least it isn't the feeling that you are simply out of your own control and the facts are driving you to act that way. If you realize it, I think you can do something more about it. A veteran at the conclusion of counseling puts it more briefly and more positively. My attitude toward myself is changed now to where I feel I can do something with myself and life. He has come to view himself as the instrument by which some reorganization can take place. There is another clinical observation which may be cited in support of the general hypothesis that there is a close relationship between behavior and the way in which reality is viewed by the individual. It has many cases that behavior changes come about, for the most part imperceptibly and almost automatically, once the perceptual reorganization has taken place. A young wife who has been reacting violently to her maid and has been quite disorganized in her behavior as a result of this antipathy says, After I discovered it was nothing more than that she resembled my mother, she didn't bother me any more. Isn't that interesting? She is still the same. Here is a clear statement indicating that though the basic perceptions have not changed, they have been differently organized, have acquired a new meaning and that behavior changes then occur. Similar evidence is given by a client, a trained psychologist, who after completing a brief series of client-centered interviews, writes, Another interesting aspect of the situation was in connection with the changes in some of my attitudes. When the change occurred, it was as if earlier attitudes were wiped out as completely as if erased from a blackboard. When a situation which would formerly have provoked a given type of response occurred, it was not as if I was tempted to act in the way I formerly had, but in some way found it easier to control my behavior. Rather, the new type of behavior came quite spontaneously, and it was only through a deliberate analysis that I became aware that I was acting in a new and different way. Here again, it is of interest that the imagery is put in terms of visual perception, and that as attitudes are erased from the blackboard, behavior changes take place automatically and without conscious effort. Thus, we have observed that appropriate changes in behavior occur when the individual acquires a different view of his world of experience, including himself. That this changed perception does not need to be dependent upon a change in the reality, but may be a product of internal reorganization that in some instances the awareness of the capacity for reperceiving experience accompanies this process of reorganization, that the altered behavioral responses occur automatically and without conscious effort as soon as the perceptual reorganization has taken place, apparently as a result of this. In view of these observations, a second hypothesis may be stated, which is closely related to the first. It is that behavior is not directly influenced or determined by organic or cultural factors, but primarily, and perhaps only, by the perception of these elements. In other words, the crucial element in the determination of behavior is the perceptual field of the individual. While this perceptual field is, to be sure, deeply influenced and largely shaped by cultural and physiological forces, it is nevertheless important that it appears to be only the field as it is perceived which exercises a specific determining influence 
upon behavior. This is not a new idea in psychology, but its applications have not always been fully recognized. It might mean, first of all, that if it is the perceptual field which determines behavior, then the primary object of study for psychologists would be the person and his world as viewed by the person himself. It could mean that the internal frame of reference of the person might well constitute the field of psychology, an idea set forth persuasively by Sneak and Combs in a significant manuscript as yet unpublished. It might mean that the laws which govern behavior would be discovered more deeply by turning our attention to the laws which govern perception. Now, if our speculations contain a measure of truth, if the specific determinant of behavior is the perceptual field, and if the self can reorganize that perceptual field, then what are the limits of this process? Is the reorganization of perception capricious, or does it follow certain laws? Are there limits to the degree of reorganization? If so, what are they? In this connection, we have observed with some care the perception of one portion of the field of experience, the portion we call the self. End of Some Observations on the Organization of Personality, Part 1《Some Observations on the Organization of Personality》Part 2 by Carl R. Rogers This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Read by Om123 Some Observations on the Organization of Personality Part 2 by Carl R. Rogers, 1947 Address of the Retiring President of the American Psychological Association, the September 1947 Annual Meeting. First published in American Psychologist, Volume 2, pages 358 to 368. The Relation of Perception of the Self to Adjustment Initially, we are oriented by background of both lay and psychological thinking to regard the outcome of successful therapy as the solution of problems. If a person had a marital problem, a vocational problem, a problem of educational adjustment, the obvious purpose of counseling or therapy was to solve that problem. But as we observe and study the recorded accounts of the conclusion of therapy, it is clear that the most characteristic outcome is not necessarily solution of problems, but a freedom from tension, a different feeling about and perception of self. Perhaps something of this outcome may be conveyed by some illustrations. Several statements taken from the final interview of a 20-year-old young woman, Miss Meir, give indications of the characteristic attitude towards self, and the sense of freedom which appears to accompany it. I have always tried to be what the others thought I should be, but now I am wondering whether I should not just see that I am what I am. Well, I have just noticed such a difference. I find that when I feel things, even when I feel hate, I don't care, I don't mind. I feel more free somehow. I don't feel guilty about things. You know, it's suddenly as though a big cloud has been lifted off. I feel so much more content. Note, in these statements, the willingness to perceive herself as she is, to accept herself realistically, to perceive and accept her bad attitudes as well as good ones. This realism seems to be accompanied by a sense of freedom and contentment. Miss Veeb, whose attitudes were quoted earlier, wrote out her own feelings about counseling some six weeks after the interviews were over, and gave the statement to her counselor. She begins, the happiest outcome therapy has been a new feeling about myself. As I think of it, it might be the only outcome. Certainly, it is basic to all the changes in my behavior that have resulted. In discussing her experience in therapy, she states, I was coming to see myself as a whole. I began to realize that I am one person. 
this was an important insight to me i saw that the former good academic achievement job success ease in social situations and the present withdrawal dejection apathy and failure were all adaptive behavior performed by me this meant that i had to reorganize my feelings about myself no longer holding to unrealistic notion that the very good adjustment was the expression of the real me that this neurotic behavior was not i came to feel that i am the same person sometimes functioning maturely and sometimes assuming a neurotic role in the face of what i had conceived as insurmountable problems the acceptance of myself as one person gave me strength in the process of reorganization now i had a substratum a core of unity on which to work as she continues her discussion there are such statements as i am getting more happiness in being myself i approve of myself more and i have so much less anxiety as in the previous example the outstanding aspects appear to be the realization that all of our behavior belonged to her that she could accept both the good and bad features about herself and that doing so gave her a release from anxiety and a feeling of solid happiness in both instances there is only incidental reference to the serious problems which had been initially discussed since miss meer is undoubtedly above average intelligence and miss v is a person with some psychological training it may appear that such results are found only with a sophisticated individual to counteract this opinion a quotation may be given from a statement written by a veteran of limited ability and education who had just completed counseling and was asked to write whatever reactions he had to the experience he says as for the consoling i have had i can say this it really makes a man strip his own mind bare and when he does he knows then what he really is and what he can do or at least thinks he knows himself pretty well as for myself i know that my ideas were a little too big for what i really am but now i realize one must try start out at his own level now after four visits i have a much clearer picture of myself and my future it makes me feel a little depressed and disappointed but on the other hand it has taken me out of the dark the load seems a lot lighter now that is i can see my way now i know what i want to do i know about what i can do so now that i can see my goal i'll be able to work a whole lot easier at my own level although the expression is much simpler one notes again the same two elements the acceptance of self as it is and the feeling of easiness of lighted burden which accompanies it as we examine many individual case records and case recordings it appears to be possible to bring together the findings in regard to successful therapy by stating another hypothesis in regard to that portion of the perceptual field which we call the self it would appear that when all of the ways in which the individual perceives himself all perceptions of the qualities abilities impulses and attitudes of the person and all perceptions of himself in relation to others are accepted into organized conscious concept of the self that this achievement is accompanied by feelings of comfort and freedom from tension which are experienced as psychological adjustment this hypothesis would seem to account for the observed fact that the comfortable perception of self which is achieved is sometimes more positive than before sometimes more negative when the individual permits all his perceptions of himself to be organized into one pattern the picture is sometimes more flattering than he has held in the past sometimes less flattering it is always more comfortable it may be pointed out also that this tentative hypothesis supplies an operational type of definition based on the client's internal frame of reference for such hitherto vague terms as adjustment integration and acceptance of self they are defined in terms of perception in a way which it should be possible to prove or disprove when all of the organic perceptual experiences the experiencing of attitudes impulses abilities and disabilities the experience of others and of reality when all of these perceptions are freely assimilated into an organized and consistent system available to consciousness then psychological adjustment or integration might be said to exist 
The definition of adjustment is thus made an internal affair, rather than dependent upon an external reality. Something of what is meant by this acceptance and assimilation of perceptions about the self may be illustrated from the case of Miss Nam, a student. Like many other clients, she gives evidence of having experienced attitudes and feelings which are defensively denied because they are not consistent with the concept or picture she holds of herself. The way in which they are first fully admitted into consciousness and then organized into a unified system may be shown by excerpts from the recorded interviews. She has spoken of the difficulties she has had in bringing herself to write papers for her university courses. I just thought of something else which perhaps hinders me, and that is that again it's two different feelings. When I have to sit down and do a paper, do I have a lot of ideas? Underneath I think I always have the feeling that I just can't do it. I have this feeling of being terrifically confident that I can do something, without being willing to put the work into it. At other times I am practically afraid of what I have to do. Note that the conscious self has been organized as having a lot of ideas, being terrifically confident, but that underneath, in other words, not freely admitted into consciousness, has been the experience of feeling I just can't do it. She continues, I am trying to work through this funny relationship between this terrible confidence and then this almost fear of doing anything. And I think the kind of feeling that I can really do things is part of an illusion I have about myself of being in my imagination sure that it will be something good and very good and all that. But whenever I get down to the actual task of getting started, it's a terrible feeling of, well, incapacity, that I won't get it done either the way I want to do it or even not being sure how I want to do it. Again, the picture of herself which is present in consciousness is that of a person who is very good, but this picture is entirely out of line with the actual organic experience in the situation. Later in the same interview she expresses very well the fact that her perceptions are not all organized into one consistent conscious self. I am not sure about what kind of a person I am. Well, I realize that all of these are a part of me, but I am not quite sure of how to make all these things fall in line. In the next interview, we have an excellent opportunity to observe the organization of both of these conflicting perceptions into one pattern, with a resultant sense of freedom from tension which has been described above. It's very funny, even as I sit here I realize that I have more confidence in myself, in the sense that when I used to approach new situations, I would have two very funny things operating at the same time. I had a fantasy that I could do anything, which was a fantasy which covered over all these other feelings that I really couldn't do it, or couldn't do it as well as I wanted to. And it's as if now those two things have merged together, and it is more real that the situation isn't either testing myself or proving something to myself or anyone else. It's just in terms of doing it. And I think I have done away both with that fantasy and that fear. So I think I can go ahead and approach things, well, just sensibly. No longer it is necessary for his client to cover over experiences. Instead, the picture of herself as very able and the experienced feeling of complete inability have now been brought together into one integrated pattern of self as a person with real but imperfect abilities. Once the self is thus accepted, the inner energies making for self-actualization are released, and she attacks her life problems more efficiently. Observing this type of material frequently in counseling experience would lead to a tentative hypothesis of maladjustment which, like the other hypothesis suggested, focuses on the perception of self. It might be proposed that the tensions called psychological maladjustment exist when the organized concept of self, conscious or available to conscious awareness, is not in accord with the perceptions actually experienced. This discrepancy between the concept of self and the actual perceptions seems to be explicable only in terms of the fact that the self-concept resists assimilating itself any percept which is inconsistent with its present organization. 
the feeling that she may not have the ability to do a paper is inconsistent with miss name's conscious picture of herself as a very able and confident person and hence though fleetingly perceived is denied organization as a part of herself until this comes about in therapy the conditions of change of self-perception if the way in which the self is perceived has as close and significant a relationship to behavior as has been suggested then the manner in which this perception may be altered becomes a question of importance if a reorganization of self-perceptions bring a change in behavior if adjustment and maladjustment depend on the congruence between perceptions as experienced and the self as perceived then the factors which permit a reorganization of the perception of self are significant our observations of psychotherapeutic experience would seem to indicate that absence of any treat to the self-concept is an important item in the problem normally the self resists incorporating into self those experiences which are inconsistent with the functioning of self but a point overlooked by lecky and others is that when the self is free from any treat of attack or likelihood of attack then it is possible for the self to consider these hitherto rejected perceptions to make new differentiations and to reintegrate the self in such a way as to include them an illustration from the case of miss Veeb may serve to clarify this point in her statement written six weeks after the conclusion of counseling miss Veeb thus describes the way in which unacceptable percepts become incorporated into the self she writes in the earlier interviews i kept saying such things as i am not acting like myself i never acted this way before what i meant was that this withdrawn untidy and apathetic person was not myself then i began to realize that i was the same person seriously withdrawn etc now as i had been before that did not happen until after i had talked out my self-rejection same despair and doubt in the accepting situation of the interview the counselor was not startled or shocked i was telling him all these things about myself which did not fit into my picture of a graduate student a teacher a sound person he responded with complete acceptance and warm interest without heavy emotional overtones here was a sane intelligent person wholeheartedly accepting this behavior that seemed so shameful to me i can remember an organic feeling of relaxation i did not have to keep up the struggle to cover up and hide this shameful person note how clearly one can see here the whole range of denied perceptions of self and the fact that they could be considered as a part of self only in a social situation which involved no treat to the self in which another person the counselor becomes almost an alternate self and looks with understanding and acceptance upon these same perceptions she continues retrospectively it seems to me that what i felt as warm acceptance without emotional overtones was what i needed to work through my difficulties the counselor's impersonality with interest allowed me to talk out my feelings the clarification in the interview situation presented the attitude to me as a thing and such which i could look at manipulate and put in place in organizing my attitudes i was beginning to organize me here the nature of exploration of experience of seeing it as experience and not as a treat to self enables the client to reorganize her perceptions of self which as she says was also reorganizing me if we attempt to describe in more conventional psychological terms the nature of the process which culminates in an altered organization and integration of self in the process of therapy it might run as follows the individual is continually endeavoring to meet his needs by reacting to the field of experience as he perceives it and to do that more efficiently by differentiating elements of the field and reintegrating them into new patterns reorganization of the field may involve the reorganization of the self as well as of other parts of the field the self however resists reorganization and change in everyday life individual adjustment by means of reorganization of the field exclusive of the self is more common and is less threatening to the individual consequently 
the individual's first mode of adjustment is the reorganization of that part of the field which does not include the self. Client-centered therapy is different from other life situations inasmuch as the therapy stands to remove from the individual's immediate world all those aspects of the field which the individual can reorganize except the self. The therapist, by reacting to the client's feelings and attitudes rather than to the objects of his feelings and attitudes, assists the client in bringing from background into focus his own self making it easier than ever before for the client to perceive and react to the self. By offering only understanding and no trace of evaluation, the therapist removes himself as an object of attitudes, becoming only an alternate expression of the client's self. The therapist, by providing a consistent atmosphere of permissiveness and understanding, removes whatever treat existed to prevent all perceptions of the self from emerging into figure. Hence, in this situation, all the ways in which the self has been experienced can be viewed openly and organized into a complex unity. It is then this complete absence of any factor which would attack the concept of self, and second, the assistance in focusing upon the perception of self, which seems to permit a more differentiated view of self, and finally the reorganization of self. Relationship to Current Psychological Thinking Up to this point, these remarks have been presented as clinical observations and tentative hypotheses, quite apart from a relationship to past or present thinking in the field of psychology. This has been intentional. It is felt that it is the function of the clinician to try to observe, with an open-minded attitude, the complexity of material which comes to him, to report his observations, and in the light of this to formulate hypotheses and problems which both the clinic and the laboratory may utilize as a basis for study and research. Yet though these are clinical observations and hypotheses, they have, as has doubtless been recognized, a relationship to some of the currents of theoretical and laboratory thinking in psychology. Some of the observations about the self bear a relationship to the thinking of G. H. Mead about the I and the me. The outcome of therapy may be described in Mead's terms as the increasing awareness of the I and the organization of the Mead by the I. The importance which has been given in this paper to the self as an organizer of experience and to some extent as an architect of self bears a relationship to the thinking of Alport and others concerning the increased place which we must give to the integrative function of the ego. In the stress which has been given to the present field of experience as the determinant of behavior, the relationship to gestalt psychology and to the work of Lewin and his students is obvious. The theories of Engel find some parallel in our observations. His view that the self represents only a small part of the biological organism which has reached symbolic elaboration and that it often attempts the direction of the organism on the basis of unreliable and insufficient information seems to be particularly related to the observations we have made. Like his posthumous book, small in size but large in the significance of its contribution, has brought a new light on the way in which the self operates, and the principle of consistency by which new experiences included in or excluded from the self. Much of his thinking runs parallel to our observations. Snyke and Combs have recently attempted a more radical and more complete emphasis upon the internal world of perception as the basis for all psychology, a statement which has helped to formulate a theory in which our observations feed. It is not only from the realm of theory but also from the experimental laboratory that one finds confirmation of the line of thinking which has been proposed. Tolman has stretched the need of thinking as a rat if fruitful experimental work is to be done. The work of Sneak indicates that rat behavior may be better predicted by inferring the rat's field of perception than by viewing him as an object. Kras, Krasovsky, showed in a brilliant study some years ago that rat learning can only be understood if we realize that the rat is consistently acting upon one hypothesis after another. Leeper has summarized the evidence from a number of experimental investigations. 
showing that animal behavior cannot be explained by simple SR mechanisms, but only by recognizing that complex internal processes of perceptual organization intervene between the stimulus and the behavioral response. Thus, there are parallel streams of clinical observation, theoretical thinking, and laboratory experiment, which all point up the fact that for an effective psychology we need a much more complete understanding of the private world of the individual, and need to learn ways of entering and studying that world from within. Implications It would be misleading, however, if I left you with the impression that the hypothesis I have formulated in this paper, or those springing from the parallel psychological studies I have mentioned, are simply extensions of the mainstream of psychological thinking additional bricks in the edifice of psychological thought. We have discovered with some surprise that our clinical observations and the tentative hypotheses which seem to grow out of them raise disturbing questions which appear to cast it out on the very foundations of many of our psychological endeavors, particularly in the fields of clinical psychology and personality study. To clarify what is meant, I should like to restate in more logical order the formulations I have given and to leave you with certain questions and problems which each one seems to raise. If we take first the tentative proposition that the specific determinant of behavior is the perceptual field of the individual, would this not lead, if regarded as a working hypothesis, to a radically different approach in clinical psychology and personality research? It would seem to mean that, instead of elaborate case histories full of information about a person as an object, we would endeavor to develop ways of seeing his situation, his past and himself, as these objects appear to him. We would try to see with him, rather than to evaluate him. It might mean the minimizing of the elaborate psychometric procedures by which we have endeavored to measure or value the individual from our own frame of reference. It might mean the minimizing or discarding of all the vast series of labels which we have painstakingly built up over the years. Paranoid pre-schizophrenic, compulsive, constricted, terms such as these might become irrelevant because they are all based in thinking which takes an external frame of reference. They are not the ways in which the individual experiences himself. If we consistently studied each individual from the internal frame of reference of that individual, from within his own perceptual field, it seems probable that we should find generalizations which could be made, and principles which are operative but we may be very sure that they would be of a different order from these externally based judgments about individuals. Let us look at another of the suggested propositions. If we took seriously the hypothesis that integration and adjustment are internal conditions related to the degree of acceptance or non-acceptance of all perceptions, then the degree of organization of these perceptions into one consistent system this would decidedly affect our clinical procedures. It would seem to imply the abandonment of the notion that adjustment is dependent upon the pleasantness or unpleasantness of the environment, and would demand concentration upon these processes which bring about self-integration within the person. It would mean a minimizing or an abandoning of those clinical procedures which utilize the alteration of environmental forces as a method of treatment. It would rely instead upon the fact that the person who is internally unified has the greatest likelihood of meeting environmental problems constructively, either as an individual or in cooperation with others. If we take the remaining proposition that the self, under proper conditions, is capable of reorganizing, to some extent, its own perceptual field, and of thus altering behavior, these two seems to raise disturbing questions. Following the path of this hypothesis would appear to mean a shift in emphasis in psychology from focusing upon the fixity of personality attributes and psychological abilities to the alterability of these same characteristics. It would concentrate upon process rather than upon fixed stages. Whereas psychology has, in personality study, been concerned primarily with the measurement of the fixed qualities of the individual and with his past in order to explain his present, the hypothesis here suggested would seem to concern itself much more with the personal world of the present in order to understand the future, and in predicting that future would be concerned with the principle by which personality and behavior are altered, 
as well as the extent to which they remain fixed. Thus we find that a clinical approach, client-centered therapy, has led us to try to adopt the client's perceptual field as the basis for genuine understanding. In trying to enter this internal world of perception, not by introspection, but by observation and direct inference, we find ourselves in a new vantage point for understanding personality dynamics, a vantage point which opens up some disturbing vistas. We find that behavior seems to be better understood as a reaction to this reality as perceived. We discover that the way in which the person sees himself and the perceptions he dares not take as belonging to himself seem to have an important relationship to the inner peace which constitutes adjustment. We discover within a person, under certain conditions, a capacity for the restructuring and the reorganization of self, and consequently the reorganization of behavior, which has profound social implications. We see these observations and the theoretical formulations which they inspire as a fruitful new approach for study and research in various fields of psychology. References 1. Alport, Gordon W. The Ego in Contemporary Psychology. Psychological Review, Year 1943, Volume 50, pages 451 to 478. 2. Angel Andrus, Foundations for a Science of Personality. New York, Commonwealth Fund, 1941. 3. Krasevsky I, Hypothesis in Rats, Psychological Review, Year 1932. Volume 39, pages 516 to 532. 4. Lecky Prescott. Self Consistency, a Theory of Personality. New York, Island Press, 1945. 5. Leeper Robert. The Experimental Psychologists as Reluctant Dragons. Paper presented at APA meeting, September 1946. 6. Levin Cott, A Dynamic Theory of Personality, New York, Macro Hill, 1935. 7. Meet George H., Mind, Self, and Society, Chicago, University of Chicago Press, 1934. 8. Rosers Carl R., Significant Aspects of Client Center Therapy, American Psychologist, 1946, Volume 1. Pages 415 to 422. 9. Snyder W. E. Wormed in Non Directive Counseling. Journal of Abnormal Social Psychology, Year 1946, Volume 41, pages 491 to 495. 10. Steve Donald. Images in which rats take the longer path to food. Journal of Psychology, Year 1936, Volume 1, pages 153 to 166. 11. Snake, Donald, and Combs, Arthur W. Book manuscript, loaned to present author, in process of publication. New York, Harper and Brothers. 12. Tolman E. C. The Determiners of Behavior at a Choice Point. Psychological Review. Year 1938. Volume 45. Pages 1 to 41. End of Some Observations on the Organization of Personality, Part 2.